Good morning, everyone. Uh, please go ahead and take a seat and don't talk too loudly so other people can hear. Um, good morning and thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Ian Goodfellow. I'm a research scientist at Google Brain. Uh, this tutorial is about generative adversarial networks that I invented in 2014 while I was at University of Montreal. I've, I've organized this tutorial along with Mihaela Roska, a research engineer at DeepMind. Together we've chosen several people who have done important work on generative adversarial networks over the past few years, and you'll hear from several speakers throughout the day. To begin the day, I'll give you a brief presentation about what generative adversarial networks are. I'll aim to give you enough background that you can understand the other speakers, and I'll tell you some of the different things that you can do with generative adversarial nets. Then throughout the day, different speakers will go into much more detail on several specific topics related to this general framework. The basic idea of generative adversarial networks is there a way of solving the generative modeling problem. The goal of generative modeling is to observe a training set of examples and find a probability distribution that explains where those examples came from. There are two different ways that we can do this. One is we can find a density function describing the probability distribution that generated the data. I show you an example of that in the top row of this slide where I have several different data points on a real number line and then the generative model fits, as shown on the right, a Gaussian density function that has the correct mean and standard deviation to explain where those data points came from. Another way that we can solve the generative modeling problem is rather than representing the probability density function explicitly, we can design a computer program that is able to generate more samples from that same distribution. I demonstrate this in the bottom half of this slide, where on the left I show several uh, images from the ImageNet training example, the ImageNet training data set. On the right, I show what we would like the model to do. We'd like it to generate more samples from exactly the same distribution. In this example, the images on the right are actually data. Generative models are not yet advanced enough to do exactly this. This is what we're trying to do. Between these two approaches, density modeling and sample generation, generative adversarial networks are much more focused on the second approach. The goal is primarily to generate samples that come from the right distribution. Some forms of generative adversarial networks can also tell you a density function, but their estimate of the density function is usually not as good as you get with other methods. Most approaches to uh, generative modeling are based on maximum likelihood. You write down a log probability function that tells you the probability that the model assigns to a specific data point. This probability density function is written in terms of some parameters theta. And then for a collection of data points, you maximize the expected value of the log probability of each of those data points with respect to the theta parameters. This can be difficult because if you have a model that's expressive enough to represent probability distributions over data points like natural images, this probability function can be very complicated and it may be intractable to solve this maximum likelihood problem. It may be intractable even to evaluate the probability of a single data point or its gradients. There are several different strategies for getting around this problem. Some of them are based on designing models where the probability density function is tractable you see that with models like Pixel CNN or Real NVP. Other strategies are based on approximations to the likelihood. Generative adversarial networks take a different approach. Instead of directly trying to approximate and maximize the likelihood, we have two different neural networks play a game where at the Nash equilibrium of that game, in a game theoretic sense, one of the players is required to learn to generate samples from the training distribution. The two players in this game are a generator network that produces samples and a discriminator network that determines whether samples are real or fake. On the left, I show one of the ways that we train the discriminator network. We begin by sampling a data point X from the training data and we feed it to the discriminator network, D. D can be any function that has differentiable parameters and that maps from a data point to a number between zero and one other forms of generative adversarial networks generalize this a little bit, but in the original framework, the output of the discriminator is interpreted as being a probability. Specifically, it's the probability that the input is real rather than fake. 
under a prior distribution that we show real samples half the time and fake samples half the time. In this case, on the left side of the slide, when we load real data into the discriminator, it should try to output a value of d of x that's very close to one, representing that it understands that this data is probably real rather than fake. On the right half of the slide, we show how we train the generator and also the other term of the cost function for the discriminator. To generate a random sample from the model, we begin with a set of random noise. This is just a vector that is sampled from a very simple random distribution, like a uniform distribution over 100 random variables, or maybe a 100-dimensional isotropic Gaussian distribution. It doesn't really matter exactly what characteristics this probability distribution has. And you'll see later on that in some cases you can even use structured data for this, this noise value. But it's a source of randomness that makes sure that the output of the generator varies from one sample to the next. Then we apply the generator function to this random noise z. The generator function is typically represented by a neural network. It can be any differentiable function that maps from the uh, latent noise to something that has the shape of the data. So for example, it might take a 100-dimensional noise vector as input, and it might produce a 128 by 128 by uh, 3 for R, G, and B values uh, output tensor representing an image. In this case, we're using it to represent uh, grayscale faces, so I believe there's something like 96 by 96 by 1. After we've applied the differentiable function G to the input Z, we obtain a sample from the model that hopefully looks realistic. Uh, and the discriminator function is applied to this input. The discriminator function now wants to output a value near zero to represent that this input is probably fake rather than real. The discriminator function can be trained just like any other binary classifier. We just use gradient descent on the binary cross entropy. The generator function is a little bit different from a traditional classifier. We actually train it to fool the discriminator. Uh, usually we do that by minimizing the cross entropy between the output of the discriminator and the incorrect target. So we use exactly the same loss function as we'd use for training a regular classifier, but we're giving it uh, the opposite of the correct target. So the generator is like a classifier that we're training to make the downstream layers contained in the discriminator produce the wrong answer. If you analyze the Nash equilibrium of the game that results from the discriminator trying to classify the data correctly and the generator trying to cause its outputs to be incorrectly classified, we find that at the equilibrium, the generator recovers the correct training distribution. It may not seem especially useful to be able to generate more samples like data that we already have, but there are actually several different things that you can do with generative adversarial networks and other generative models. One thing you can do is you can make training data for other machine learning models. Uh, one of the first research papers from Apple was based on this idea that they would like to train a detector that can estimate the direction that a person is looking at so that you can interact with a phone or tablet just by looking at the right part of the screen. The problem is it's difficult to get human training data where you actually know where on the screen the human is looking. Apple's way to get around this was to use a 3D model that they can position in any particular eye gaze direction they want and make 3D renderings of that model. So they can generate as much training data as they want just by changing the 3D mesh and then re-rendering it. And the problem is the synthetic images as shown on the lower left are not very realistic. So they're able to use a generative adversarial network as a refiner. Using unlabeled real images where the pose is not known as shown in the upper row of this slide. They can train a generative model that understands what real photos of eyes look like, and that model can then be used to turn the unrealistic synthetic images into realistic images that have a known position. And these realistic images of known position can then be used to train the eye gaze recognition model. A similar idea has also been used at Google to solve domain adaptation problems to help uh, robotic grasping models operate in more cluttered environments than the synthetic training data would, would normally be able to make them operate in. Another useful aspect of generative models is that they learn a probability distribution over all of the different variables in an image. So rather than needing to use an image as input and get a single label as output, it's possible to use any subset of pixels as input and get any subset of pixels as output. 
In this demonstration, it's possible to recover a face from just a few pixels in an image using a model of faces that was learned by a generative adversarial network. A particularly interesting version of missing data is semi-supervised learning, where there are several unlabeled images and very few labeled images. If you use a generative adversarial network where the discriminator outputs a distribution over all of the real classes and then an additional fake class, as well as the real classes, this is actually a very good approach for semi-supervised learning. The discriminator is exercised on samples from the generator, as well as being exercised on unlabeled real examples. For the unlabeled real examples, it tries to maximize the sum over the probabilities assigned to all of the real classes. And on fake examples from the generator, it tries to maximize the probability of the fake class. This approach has been state of the art for several different semi-supervised learning tasks and can get an error rate of less than 1% at handwriting recognition using only 100 labeled examples. It actually beats results from just a few years ago that used 60,000 labeled examples. Generative adversarial networks are very good for helping machine learning algorithms understand that there can be multiple correct answers when you ask them to solve a prediction problem and that they should choose one of the many possible correct answers rather than averaging all of them together. If we look at the problem of video frame prediction, there are usually multiple possible futures. As we think about what happens when we rotate this 3D image of a person's head, we don't know exactly how far it will rotate by the next frame. And so there might be many slightly different images we could produce that are plausible next frames for this video. If we use mean squared error, as shown in the middle of this slide, mean squared error will average together all of those possible futures. And you'll get something like the average of those images where the ear becomes blurry, the eye becomes blurry, and the edges of the person's face are not as sharply defined as they could be. If we additionally use an adversarial loss, as shown on the right, then features like the ear remain preserved very well. Because the ear is a recognizable pattern, the discriminator network would not accept any sample that is missing an ear. The discriminator could detect the absence of the ear as a sign that the image is not realistic. And that forces the generator to produce a sample that actually comes from the set of allowable next images instead of averaging together all the possible next images. These results have worked very well for, um, for video prediction. Uh, if you go to the um, keynote version of these slides online, you can actually play these YouTube videos from a, a Facebook AI research paper where generative adversarial networks are able to actually move basketball players around the court. I don't actually have enough Wi-Fi to play them here, though. Uh, also, there are many engineering tasks that actually rely on the idea of making realistic images. And uh, you know, it, in some cases, realistic images are not an end in themselves, but for a lot of commercial purposes, they can be. Uh, for example, on this slide, does anybody in the audience want to take a guess about uh, which photos in this, uh, in, in this grid are actually real photos? Or, or let's just actually say how many of them. That'll, that'll be easier for you to guess. Um, raise your hand if you think only one of these is real. Uh, raise your hand if you think only two of these are real. Uh, raise your hand if you think three or more of these are real. Yeah, so actually, the answer is two. Uh, most, most people, the, the largest number of hands I saw was for three or more are real. Actually, uh, two of them are real. And I don't even remember which two for sure. Uh, <laughs> so this is from a company called View.ai that works on making commercial imagery for retailers to use to advertise clothing in, in their websites and magazines and so on. The way that this works is the retailer can take a photo of the clothing laying flat on a table and then they can specify the size of the model that they would like to be shown wearing the clothing. The generative model then synthesizes a, a photo of a model of that size wearing the clothing fitted to them. Um, another thing that you can do with generative adversarial networks is you can learn useful embeddings that help to uh, solve other problems like search and sorting or to learn about the structure of the data that you're working with. Um, if you've seen things like natural language models before, then you know that things like word to vec can learn to associate specific words with points in an embedding space so that you can do things like take the word queen and find its word embedding vector, subtract off the word embedding vector for female, add the word embedding vector for male, and get 
a vector that's very near the vector for king. It turns out that you can do a similar thing with generative adversarial networks. The z vectors that are used as the random input to generate the images are actually, um, they're, they're latent representations of the images, just like word vectors are latent representations of the meaning of words. In this example, uh, Alec Radford and his collaborators found three different vectors that decode to an image of a man with glasses, an image of a man, and an image of a woman. All of these three photos on the left side of the slide are synthetic images, they're not, they're not training data. If you take these latent vectors and you subtract off the vector for man from the vector with man with glasses, and then you add the vector for woman, the result decodes to images of a woman wearing glasses. So this is very similar to the result with uh, king and queen for word to vec. What's maybe a little bit more exciting here is that uh, king and queen are just uh, single points in one hot vector space. Here to actually get the idea of woman with glasses, it's necessary to draw a high resolution photo with thousands of pixels that all have to be coordinated with each other to make a realistic image. So the degree of understanding of what the model outputs is much higher than it was necessary with uh, word to vec This means that the model has been able to discover useful categories on its own. We didn't actually supervise the model with labels like man or woman or glasses or no glasses. By studying this large data set, it was able to uncover these different relationships and learn a lot about how glasses are a category that can explain a lot of images and tell it which pixels to draw. And gender is a category that can explain how to draw pixels of different faces. The ability of these generative models to do this is the reason that they're useful for tasks like semi-supervised learning. Uh, you might wonder how long it will be until generative adversarial networks are actually able to solve the task that I showed on my first slide, where we give it high resolution images from the ImageNet data set and they produce new samples from the ImageNet data set. At the moment, no generative model is able to solve this particular problem especially well without extra help. There's a model called plug and play generative networks that's able to do it with uh, supervision. And so far those haven't generalized to tasks other than specifically the ImageNet data set. Generative adversarial networks are not quite there yet, but they're getting close. Um, Augustus Odina's auxiliary class GANs are able to draw high resolution images from each of the different categories of the ImageNet data set. They're recognizable, but they're certainly not indistinguishable from the training data. There, there's clear artifacts in each of the different categories that we get. Uh, you'll see later today that in other domains where there are fewer classes, it's possible to make much more higher quality images than these. One of the main challenges for generative adversarial networks is being able to produce samples from a very broad and diverse set of classes. So ImageNet has a thousand classes and that makes it relatively difficult for the, them to capture all of them. Even these results here are based on dividing ImageNet into 100 subdivided categories with 10 classes in each, and then having a separate generator network learn to model each of those uh, 10 category sub data sets. Over time, we're seeing a lot of new models coming out related to generative adversarial networks. You can track these updates on a web page called the GANZU. It's a GitHub repository, so if you write a new GAN paper, you can submit a pull request to be added to the GAN zoo. Uh, you can see that especially over the last year, the number of GAN papers has, or the number of named GAN variants has really increased dramatically. I'm available for a few minutes for questions, and then I'll announce the next speaker. Yeah, the question is, is the discriminator network doing something like novelty detection? And I think it depends a lot on the exact way that training proceeds. You can look at the way that discriminator nets are parameterized and the way that they choose to use the bias term at the softmax output layer seems to affect the way that they work a lot. Uh, sometimes they end up with bias terms that 
put a lot of mass on the real class. And so the biases assume that things are real by default, and then they use the weights to recognize specific characteristics of the generator net to reject things that look specifically like they come from the generator. But I've also seen other training runs where the output is that they assume everything is fake by default unless they, they, they find something that looks a lot like the training data. It's also an area where we don't have a really good systematic understanding. This is more of a few ad hoc analyses of a few specific models that I've trained. Yeah, the question is, is the latent space learned or is it coming from a predetermined distribution? Um, so you can think of it as there's a prior distribution over the latent vector Z and that's fixed, uh, but the mapping from Z to X is learned. It means that the posterior distribution over Z given X changes as you learn the, the weights controlling P of X given Z. Uh, you could also imagine, you could think of like the first layer of the generator if it's linear, you could think of that as transforming an isotropic Gaussian into a, a full rank Gaussian with a mean and covariance ch structure of the models choosing. Yeah, the question is, GANs are notoriously hard to train and what does that mean exactly? So partly there are a few things that are difficult from a theoretical point of view. For most models that are based on optimization, we can monitor their cost function and we can see how it decreases over time. For generative adversarial networks, there are two different players and it's difficult to understand exactly what we should monitor. If the discriminator obtains a very low cost, it's hard to tell if that's because the discriminator is doing well or if the generator is doing poorly, for example. They're also difficult to train from more of a practical point of view. A lot of versions of generative adversarial networks are, are not very robust to hyperparameters. So you can spend a lot of time tuning them before you get good performance. Overall, I would say that generative adversarial networks today remind me a lot of the state of deep learning in maybe about like 2010 or so. Since about 2012, we've known that if you just use rectified linear units, backprop and something like gradient descent with momentum or later atom, you get pretty good results. Uh, back in about 2010, we spent a lot of time fiddling with hyperparameters for things like unsupervised pre-training algorithms and you know, Markov chains to make Fulton machines mix and things like that. I think that after a few more years, we'll know recipes that just reliably get good results out of generative adversarial nets, but at the moment, we don't have those recipes yet. So there's a lot more manual effort and trial and error that goes into getting them to work. By transfer learning, you mean like classifying real data or, or another task? Uh, yeah, so the question is, can you do transfer learning with the discriminator? The basic way that we do that is a traditional discriminator outputs a probability distribution over two classes, the real class and the fake class. If you would like to use a discriminator that can classify ImageNet, then ImageNet has a thousand classes. You can make a new discriminator that has a thousand and one classes, one for each of the real ImageNet classes, and then one for the class of fake things. If you train it to both classify ImageNet and to reject fake samples, then you, you get a model that may generalize better than the, than the traditional supervised learning model might be. So far, we've mostly seen an advantage to that approach if you have a lot of unlabeled data in addition to the labeled data. We don't know of an advantage of training with a generative adversarial net framework on a fully labeled data set. It would still be better to just do supervised learning directly, or not necessarily better, but comparable. Okay, um, our next speaker will be the co-organizer of this tutorial, Mihaela Roska. She is a research engineer at DeepMind and she has been one of the organizers who put together today's program. She will be uh, telling us about her work and other people's work on generative adversarial networks that have an encoder. So they essentially bridge the gap between two of the big approaches to generative models, uh, generative adversarial networks and variational autoencoders.